guys, he was messy. Or maybe just a concerned father and he was worried because his other daughter wasn't gonna have a man. I don't know. Anyways, not the point. Whatever, major loser. <laughs> Lord, I've cried so much today. You're like, guys, like I just, whew. <laughs> it's always I, 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 me, me, me. Come on. Jesus never cared. <laughs> So if you don't want somebody talking about God, don't invite me. That's it. Point blank, period. All right. I'm almost in there. Sorry, I'm almost done crying. Now that my makeup is ruined. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Hold on. Welcome back to Talks with Tally, or welcome to Talks with Tally. If you've never been on my channel before, this segment on my channel, Time with Tally, is dedicated to the word that the Lord has placed on my heart for you all. And today we have a word that's a little emotional, I'm not going to lie. So without further ado, we're going to get right into it. We're going to pray and we're gonna see what the Lord has to say to us today. Father God, I come before you in this moment, Lord, presenting myself as your child, Lord. I ask you in this moment, Lord, that the word that you have placed on my heart, Lord, let it be one that people need to hear on the other side of that screen, Lord, under the sound of my voice right now, Lord, that whoever this message is for, Father God, let it be you touching their hearts, encountering them in a way that is undeniable and unshakable, Father God. Let it be you healing hearts, Lord, and turning their gazes towards you, Father. Put a filter in front of my mouth so it be you speaking, Lord, not me. More of you, less of me, Father God. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's do this. All right, so the word that we have for today is titled, Amongst the Unwanted. Ooh, and you might be thinking, what? Where's this going? I'm about to get into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. This is episode seven of Talks with Tally. How beautiful. Seven, the number of divine perfection, the number of the Lord, right? So today we're going to talk about a topic that I feel like truly all of us have encountered at one point in our life or another. And it is the topic of rejection. A rejection is a refusal to accept, use, or believe in something or someone. Who? All right, then. The thing about rejection is the fact that someone's refusing to see something that's right in front of them. Oh, we're already starting like that, Lord? Okay. <laughs> it is the refusal to take part in something that's presented right in front of you. So this word came to my heart when I started reading about the ministry of Jesus, right? In Matthew, where there's this one verse that stuck out to me. And it was when someone came to the door and someone had said to Jesus, he sits with sinners and tax collectors. What is he doing? We'll get to that in a second. But what really struck me in that moment was, and many people could say that there were lots of similarities between the disciples and Jesus, right? But what struck out to me was that there's this one specific thing that they all have in common that I don't feel like a lot of people really put their attention to. And it's the fact that like his disciples, Jesus was also unwanted. He was amongst the unwanted, the rejected of the people. And you might be like, oh, Jesus, he actually was this powerful figure. What are you talking about? He was the teacher. He was the master. He wasn't reject. He was rejected by his own people. He firstly came here to rescue the Jews and he was rejected by his own people. He was a Jew. And a lot of us know that feeling, right? That rejection, it leads to that loneliness, the sadness, the anger, sometimes jealousy or guilt and shame, low self-esteem. I don't even know if I already said it, but low self-esteem, embarrassment. And, and on top of that, it also causes an instability in your identity. Therefore, a lot of us then seek out external things, external factors, materialistic things to end up filling that void of what our identity is and who we are supposed to be. When I was constructing this message, it was interesting because something that came to my mind was the lost and found. No idea, Ryan, right? I have no idea why that would come to my mind. I'm just like the lost and found, like when people like lose things and like objects, like the actual physical place, like that's, that's what I thought of. Lord, glory to you, Father. This was the place where Jesus would be reunited with his people. In this specific verse, we are seeing a personification of a lost and found. Lord! Wow, that's so beautiful. Wow, wow, wow. The lost and found is defined as a place where lost items are stored to await retrieval by their owners. <laughs> Lord, I've cried so much today. You're like, guys, like I just, 
Whew. It's so wild to me. It's so interesting because it says here, they're not meant to stay there. You are not meant to stay there. You are meant to be retrieved by your owner. And this doesn't mean that sometimes we don't give ourselves away to the wrong owner. Mm. We give our hearts and our worth and our value into the hands of someone that can misuse them, that can manipulate us to believe that their intentions are good. And I'm not just talking about physical human beings. Because how many times will the enemy also allow you to believe that sin is good? And it's fun because it makes you feel good. We rebuke him in Jesus' mighty name. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. This word is a reminder that you are wanted enough to be found again. Thing is, do you want to be found though? Would you allow him to find you again? Wow. The thing is, is that he already knows exactly where you are. You just have to put in the effort to actually find him. And this may be a connection that you've never had before, or maybe one that you also have to reestablish now. And this time it'll be so different because it'll feel as if you truly have never had access to it before. When I left, right? And I left God, I left the church. I separated myself from the Lord 15 years ago. I never truly realized what I was leaving behind because I never really truly knew him. I knew what the church taught me. And in reality, they didn't really teach me exactly who God was. They didn't exemplify to me who he was. They didn't teach me right. And that's not to blame them for my leaving because that was a choice that I had made. I have my own free will, of course, as we all do. But this time around, the God I actually found, the one that was there all along, but I couldn't see him past the lies. I couldn't see him past the false teachings. I couldn't see him past all the things I still wanted to see. The things I wanted to stay stuck in. Come on, Lord. I had a blurred vision. I had no clarity. I didn't know where to look. So this happens sometimes where we give ourselves and our hearts and put them in places that they don't belong. But this word was brought to my heart to remind you and or to tell you if you've never been told that he loves you, that you belong to him. When we get lost like that, it's most of the time because of ourself, not because that's what he wants. It's always I, 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 me, me, me. I want control. I wanna know what's gonna happen next. When in reality, we don't even realize how much better it is for us to actually let go and let God do what he has to, what he wants to. When we do things by our own power, we're always trying to fill this hole, this void, the void of wanting to feel good enough to finding an identity, to finding a purpose, whether you're trying to prove it to yourselves, to your family, to others, to a workplace, whatever it may be. When you truly know God, you realize I am enough only through him and because he said so. Oof. Having in your history the trauma and the experience of being rejected is not to be expected to accompany a king, which is what Jesus is. And isn't it so amazing the way that the Lord really experienced everything that we experience? So we can't turn back to him and say, well, you don't understand. He was rejected too. And from that rejection, he went to the rejected and chose to perform miracles on them. The Gentiles were rejected. Ooh, the Romans, they were enemies with the Jews. Yet then the Lord says, well, the Jews don't wanna hear about me. They don't wanna accept me. My own people don't want me. Rejected by my own people. So you know what? Now you all get a chance. Ah! <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. He was amongst the unwanted, even by his own family, guys. The word says in John 7, 5, for not even his brothers believed in him. John 1, 11, it says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. When it was time for him to be crucified, they chose Barabbas, ba Barabbas, whatever, you know, the guy, Barnabas, I forget. <laughs> He was an actual criminal. And because his people wanted their own way, they gave him up when he was sinless and had no charge. Even the pilot who was supposed to be charging him and sending him to his crucifixion didn't want anything to do with it. He said, I find no charges on this man. But because the Jews pushed and pushed and pushed for it, he ultimately just ended up giving up and saying, fine, do with him what you must. But he didn't want to. And the word says that. Wow. To be unwanted is defined as to not be desired, to not see the value in. People can only want you for what you possess or what transactional benefit they can receive from you or by also having access to you. Unwanting leads to rejection. But I want you to also remember that both of these things can occur with people that still see your value and worth. Ooh, but they're choosing to ignore it. Lord.
good. You know what's really crazy to me? This is something that the Lord had brought to my mind when I was thinking about this because you know how many people talk about Joseph's rejection, right? Joseph and the multicolored coat. Uh, Joseph, the one that had dreams, right? His brothers rejected him, all this other stuff. We're gonna get into the strength of how generational trauma and curses are. Look at this. Everybody talks about Joseph's rejection, but what about the rejection of his brothers first? <laughs> Guys, this was a generational rejection, Lord. And some of us are called to break that generational curse, Lord God, hallelujah. This probably even began even before this. But note, Jacob, the father of Joseph, had two wives. So Jacob's sons had two moms and some concubines for others. But the most famous story that we hear about is the one about Rachel and Leah. Long story short, if you don't know the story, Jacob loved Rachel. Jacob wanted Rachel and he wanted to marry her so bad that he went to her father Laban and said, I will work for her hand in marriage because I want her. I'll work the seven years that you want. Work seven years for her, yo. Laban was messy. He was messy. Or maybe just a concerned father and he was worried because his other daughter wasn't gonna have a man. I don't know. Anyways, not the point. On the wedding night of Jacob and Rachel, which was supposed to be Jacob and Rachel, he sneaked his other daughter, Leah, into the room on the wedding night. Ooh, into the bedroom. Ah. And after finding this out, I mean, I'd be heated, bro, to find out that I had to work seven years for somebody and then I don't know where you're gonna bring me somebody else. That's wild. That, mm -mm. <laughs> Jacob is better than me. <laughs> Jacob is better than me. But here's the thing, Jacob loved Rachel so much that he worked another seven years to obtain Rachel as a wife. Ooh. Even after marrying her sister, but that's besides the point. That's not my business, that got nothing to do with me. Here's the thing, he never wanted Leah. He rejected her. And I could only imagine how their relationship went while it was still active. And then on top of that, let's just assimilate this right now. Imagine if there was rejection from the beginning in their relationship, imagine what it probably brought down to their children. Uh, hello? Jacob made it very clear that his favorite children were the children that he had with Rachel. Oh my gosh, guys, 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 guys. Benjamin and Joseph were his favorite children because they came from Rachel. So now imagine the environment that they were cultivated in where they were accepted and loved and the other brothers were rejected. Imagine what they had to experience. No wonder that they acted out and they acted against Joseph. They hated him. They sold them into slavery. In turn, what's crazy about all this is that this is why you gotta pray for your children. None of this was actually Joseph's fault. It was actually their dad's fault. Come on. He's the one that cultivated the environment of rejection in their home, therefore leading them to jealousy. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 28, brother and sisters, consider your calling. Not many of you were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish, mm, unappreciated, undervalued, misunderstood, not accepted, the rejected. These are the words I'm adding, but this is what it means. And in different Bibles, it actually says different words too. God has chosen what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing. This is straight from the Bible, guys. Lord, what is viewed as nothing to bring nothing what is viewed as something. I could cry, I'm not gonna. This is a reminder to let you know that it doesn't matter what people think of you. When you follow Christ, you're gonna have people that judge you, that persecute you, and that look at you differently. You're gonna be rejected, but I'd much rather be rejected for giving my life and my heart to him because he loved me first. You know what's really crazy to me too? A revelation the Lord gave me the other day. I always used to be somebody that said, Lord, in every single relationship I've been in with a man, any romantic relationship I've ever been in, actually even friendships a lot of the times, I've always been the one to love more. I've always been the one to love them more. When is someone gonna love me more? And I was praying and the Lord reminded me of that prayer and he showed me, I have always loved you more and I always loved you first. Ah! <laughs> Hold on. All right, I'm almost in there. Sorry, I'm almost done crying. Now that my makeup is ruined. <laughs> so again, I say to you, what people think of you does not matter. Because if they think that they're better than you, God will literally show 
and use you as a vessel for his glory, because the glory is always his, to show them that they're not by using someone of least expectancy. Mm -hmm. People expected Jesus to be something else too. They expected a king of kings, you know, lord of the armies. So they thought he was probably gonna come along with this big sword and a lot of shiny armor and all these other things, a fighter, a warrior. And that's exactly what he is, but he ended up showing up as also the prince of peace. They expected him to be something else and because he wasn't what they thought Ooh, he should be like. They rejected him. God, our expectations and our thoughts, our mind is not his. And he shows us his power like this, like doing these things by using very little to glorify his more in the end. Lord, Matthew 25, 21, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Be faithful to him in the little. When you feel at your lowest, at your smallest, just know that he can take you from glory to glory. Lord, something else that also talks about this in the word is also the genealogy in Matthew. The genealogy of Jesus' bloodline is broken down from the generations. And in Matthew's genealogy versus Luke's genealogy, Matthew's genealogy showed five women. <laughs> These women were specifically seen as the rotten apples. We had a prostitute, we had a sexual violence victim, a poor woman living in poverty, an adulteress. That's another confirmation that the Lord will use whoever he wants. And a lot of the times it's gonna be the person that nobody expects. <laughs> and he's gonna put them in glory, for his glory. <laughs> and it still shocks me because not only that, like I said before, the Lord brought himself down to earth. It says in his word that he humbled himself, he put on flesh to walk this earth. So that now when we come to him complaining of the temptations, temptations to sin, we really just can't look at God and say, you just don't understand. He literally was born a baby and grew into adulthood on this earth. He didn't skip no steps or stages. He was probably about 30, to like 33 years old when his ministry was done. So he lived into adulthood. There's a difference between knowing of something, having a knowledge of that thing or an awareness, and then also experiencing it, understanding it from a personal perspective. Jesus experienced fear. He experienced sadness, correction from his parents, anger, and above all, rejection. There's a story in the Bible that I had addressed uh, and spoken about in one of the previous messages. I forget which one, but it was the one of the lame man that was carried to the doors of the church. He was not able to walk from birth. That's what lame means. Not that he's like a loser. Whatever made you loser, I'm a child, sorry. <laughs> This lame man would be brought to the doors of the church, right outside of the doors. But what really struck me is the fact that nobody brought him inside where he needed to be for a blessing. Nobody brought him inside. They brought him halfway. Not even. God, thank you, Lord. Just shows me that us as humans will always just give half a blessing. We will get people to the point that they are so close to being where they're supposed to be, but never fully taking them to the point that they have to be. Because only God can do that. Only God can take your trauma and your rejected heart and heal it fully. There's nothing that us as humans can do to heal all of that, to find all those answers. He is the answer to everything. You know how difficult it is when people try to tell me about their life and I have to keep God out of it when he literally is the answer to everything. I can literally relate everything back to God. Every single conversation is always can be turned back to God. So if you don't want somebody talking about God, don't invite me. That's it. Point blank period. He's been the answer to my everything that I have questions about. But notice how in that story, Lord, 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 his disciples are showing him that he wouldn't be rejected by Jesus. The disciples came along, the disciples of Christ came along and showed him the real blessing, the full blessing, not a partial. They brought him the blessing that actually reaches to the end. And it was an everlasting, long-term healing that only Christ can do. Oh my gosh. And from then, the man who was rejected and not wanted, because I'm sorry, just because somebody doesn't say that you're rejected, or in the Bible, it doesn't say that they were actually rejected, based on the actions of others and the word, you can tell the difference and differentiate between who truly is accepting of another and who's not. If someone truly knew the Lord, they would bring him all the way in 
every single time regardless of what he wanted because you also have to have friends that have faith amen he does more for us than we could ever expect and what john 5 speaks of the story of the paralyzed man who was never brought to the water and this time this man believed that the spring of water that was at the center of this place it was the pool i believe of bethesda and the spring in the middle of it was believed to have some type of healing properties and powers so for 38 years this man was paralyzed he was left for dead for 38 years rejected by people because people were too selfish to go into that pool and receive their blessing first oh the first shall be last but the last shall be made first lord they were so focused on their own blessing they didn't even look to the side to see that this man needed it they weren't able to put somebody else before themselves lord wow 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 this is not in my notes glory to you father but you know what jesus did Jesus didn't walk by him. Actually, he specifically went to him. He pointed him out in the crowd of others that needed healing and said, you, the one that's been rejected for 38 years, that nobody has listened to, that nobody has tried to help, that nobody has attempted to get you to the point that you can achieve your healing and obtain it, receive it. Jesus did not care. He said, I'm gonna stop right here and I'm gonna heal you, get up. Take your mat and walk. And then on top of that, it was also on the Sabbath but you're not supposed to be doing healings or any type of work on the Sabbath. Jesus never cared. <laughs> he broke all kind of rules. Rules, which in reality, he's the law. But anyways, we can get into that another time. He did whatever was necessary to heal people, to show them real love, to show them that they are wanted. You are not forgotten by the Lord. This is the verse I was talking about in the beginning. It says, Matthew 9, verse 10 to 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. They'll be sacrificing each other, y'all. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? They're pointing them out, trying to point out the faults of others. Mm. Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? Hello? <laughs> Duh, <laughs> the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worst. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skin will burst. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. When it talks about in the word, the mixing of things, like mixing of fabrics, old and new put together, it's him reminding you that pure and impure does not mix. Because once purity is touched with impurity, it becomes contaminated. But it's so funny to me in this verse specifically because little did they know when they questioned him, he was a part of them. He, like them, was also unwanted, was also looked at funny, was also rejected was also not heard. He was one of them. He was a poor man around the poor. He was with the sinners, the tax collectors. And now you might be wondering like, well, what makes these people so bad? You know, why are they rejected? You're probably just pulling that out of nowhere, Natalia. Fishermen, biblically, ceremonially, were deemed to be unclean. They made up about 70% of the population and it was due to their work that they were deemed unclean or unworthy because most of them, actually, I think all of them came from poverty. Tax collectors were hated because if you were a Jew collecting taxes from Jews, hello, they looked at you a little funny. They thought of you to be a traitor to work for the Roman government and go against your own people because the Roman government was holding the Jews captive. And on top of that already, not only are you a traitor, but now you're also over charging people their taxes. So you're also a scammer now. Jesus was known to be a carpenter. He was a working class. And also he grew up in poverty. Trust me, you want to be unwanted by others. And isn't it so wild to think that he did all of this in efforts for you across that screen to never feel how he felt. Everything that he did on this earth was to undo what the enemy meant for evil. He was rejected so you can be accepted by him.
I'm gonna cry again. He literally is undoing and trying to undo, if you let him, everything that was meant to hurt you in every which way, the times that you were tempted, the times that you were rejected, the times that you were hurt, the times that you were not heard, or abused, scared, the times that you wanted justice and truth where evil reigned in your life. He went through all of it just to undo you having to go through all of it. This word is a reminder that he wants you though. You're not unwanted by him. Acts 2 17, it says in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. God excludes none of his children. That's including all of you that may be amongst the unwanted. You were not rejected by him. Osea, the ones that nobody wants to listen to, the ones who didn't have a voice before. Now God uses to speak through them. Hello? <laughs> People tend to forget that it's truly a miracle that we get to be in God's presence. When you feel God, that is a miracle occurring. That is something to be super grateful for, to understand that he's calling you. It's always the one that is considered to be the weakest link that the Lord uses to become the pillar. When you're unwanted by others, it actually attracts God to you. He relates to you. Now imagine, even if you had nobody else, that God actually is on your side. For him to be the only one that pops up and says, no, actually, you know what I want? I want that one. That's some crazy backup, y'all. Peter 2, 2 to 12, it says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men. Let's talk about Jesus. A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. If God is with me, who against me? Come on. This word is just a reminder that the Lord is just asking for a fair shot. A lot of the times we like to think that he just wants all this full submission and, and this surrender of everything all at once. This goes for believers and non-believers. What he wants is just an open door, the opportunity to really show you who he is. For you to not step into this with this mindset and secondary thought of, well, if this doesn't work out. Who said it wasn't? He wants you to step into this with a mustard seed size faith. All he wants is a genuine effort for you to open the door and say to him, Lord, I may not believe and I don't know how to believe, but I want to. I want you to show me who you are. I want to try. It means to a certain extent, yes, some willingness, some openness, some open-mindedness, some some submission you're putting your thoughts to submission you're putting them away and saying i don't want to believe my disbelief i'm choosing to go against what i believe right now and choosing to come to you god don't allow doubt to cloud this opportunity for you and not for nothing if you can give your ex so many chances and yet god not one real chance hello <laughs> And lastly, I just want to remind you that he wants you, yes. But then on top of that, you will go from the least wanted, the most rejected to the most wanted. This is actually a warning. Most wanted by him, yes. But don't be surprised that when you come to him, that you don't become the most wanted in the aspect of persecution. It comes on both ends because the closer that you get to God, the harder the enemy pushes. When you accept Christ into your life, you go from prisoner of and slave of sin directly to a warrior. So you will be wanted and persecuted and maybe still even rejected by some. When we come to him, it's not a full elimination of things that happen in this world, but, 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 when we come to him, there's an answer for all of that instead. And the things that used to affect you, they don't affect you anymore. Things that used to touch you, they don't touch you no more. There is no grace period in between where the enemy decides to not fight for your soul. But the good news is, is that it actually already belongs to the Lord and you are already protected because of Jesus and what he did for us on that cross. Note that when he accepts you, he has saved you, your salvation. That's his stamp of approval on you. That's his bringing you in. That's his undoing of the rejection. And I know sometimes it feels like, what is that? What's that thing called? Sometimes it feels like I was drafted into the Lord's army. <laughs> 
I didn't have a choice in this. I thought it was involuntary. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I realize now that everything that he has done for me, I owe it to him. It's something to protect, to be grateful for, and do something in return of. And it's so interesting that the ones that be unwanted and rejected the most, they also then get persecuted the most. Haven't you noticed that when somebody gets bullied a lot, all eyes are on them though? Hatred is launched at you because you are a child of God. If you truly follow him, if you're not getting some type of dislike or refusal or disapproval or rejection from some people in the world, something isn't right. It's when you're truly enveloped in him is when the battle really, really starts. It's when you're truly enveloped in him that you become a threat. So don't be ashamed because you have found a truth a love, a happiness, an acceptance that is so outside of the understanding of the human mind and of others. You are different, you are set apart, you are unique for a purpose. You're not meant to be normal and blend in. You have been chosen for a time such as this. So this is your last reminder to just focus on what it is that the Lord has said about you. And I'll leave you with this verse. In Jesus, when we accept him into our hearts and repent for our sins. Jeremiah 31, 3, it says, the Lord has appeared to us from afar saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. Wow. I love it. <laughs> God is so good. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray, y'all. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord God, I want to come before you, Lord, and just say thank you for the word that you have shared with everybody across that screen today, Lord. I ask that it be you, Lord God, comforting the hearts of those that have felt hurt, rejected, and persecuted by others, Lord. Whether they have had a relationship with you or not, Lord, I ask that in this moment, Father God, that you heal their heart. You lift off the trauma that they have experienced, Lord, and show them true acceptance, true love, true kindness, true joy, Lord. I ask that you be the one, Lord, breaking the chains of rejection in Jesus' mighty name. All feelings of guilt, of shame, of embarrassment, Father God, we ask that in this moment, Lord, you heal because only you, Father God, can take the loneliness that we feel, the less than that we feel, the lack of self-esteem and identity that we feel that we are seeking every single day and be the one to fill it be the one to give us an answer lord guide us towards you lord guide our gaze towards you father god have an encounter with every single one of the people under the sound of my voice right now lord give them an encounter with you that's undeniable and unshakable father show them that what has been rejected and thrown to the trash is actually your treasure father in jesus mighty name i pray amen and amen i hope that word was comforting and reassuring to you and a confirmation that you were not nothing in the lord you are nothing without him mm. we are nothing without him but with him come on everything all for his glory and we can do all things through christ who strengthens us it says we can do all things anyways <laughs> Thank you all for spending time with me. I truly have enjoyed this time. Glory to you, Father. Thank you for the word that you have placed on my heart. I love you all, and I'm going to see y'all in the next one. Bye.